Welcome back, everyone. I'm Peter Clausey, and this is Investor Intel. Just when you think you know everything, it turns out you don't know what you don't know. And today, we're going to be talking with Anchor Resources and Stephen Borrega about that. Steve was kind enough to share me the slideshow earlier. Steve, can you start at slide 12? Sure can. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm excited, though. This is good. Slide 12 is what your company is known for. When people talk about Anchor Resources, they talk about your relationships and your corporate social responsibility. So this we do know. So let's briefly touch on your January 2020 press release because it matters. Sure. Absolutely. You know, Peter, I think it's really interesting right now. You can't get you can't make an investment in your portfolio without considering ESG as part of the conversation. Every broker, every investment advisor has been mandated to look at these things. And look, you call it ESG. You can call it social license to operate. You can call it social corporate responsibility, whatever term you'd like to apply. The fact of the matter is, is that if you're not liked within the environment of communities that you're working in, it makes it very difficult, regardless of the quality of assets, to bring something forward. And we realize that, especially in the context of Cambodia. You know, we've been there for 12 years now, and uh, it's not very common where you can be, you can have such a strong relationship with the with the people on the ground within your your local communes, all the way up to the highest levels of government, where your prime minister starts referring to you by name. Uh, saying, please be more like Anchor. Please do work closely with your local communities and try and bring positive impacts on the ground. And we took that to heart. And we've always taken that to heart. So since 2009, we've been doing it differently. And we're very proud of that. And in fact, we've actually been asked to present our, our model at the United Nations in Geneva. So, the, so hang on, the picture on the right, the dental clinic, yes. you actually paid to send a team of dentists over to Cambodia and work on the villages for free. Well, it's it's not necessarily a, a, a pay for play kind of model here, but look, we had we identified a wonderful partner, and it's a family business. Uh, I think there's three dentists within the family, three generations of dentists. They came out of San Francisco, and they've come to Cambodia multiple times now. And sure, what we do is we provide all the logistics and we help support and identify the various communes where we could bring. Their, their expertise to bear positively. And that's the type of project that we like to work on. We've always felt that a partnership is the way to go. So whether it's a partnership with the local community, whether it's partnerships with groups like this for a dental clinic, whether it be bringing 40 uh, foot containers of medical supplies into Cambodia. These are, these are, I, these are ideas that Mike and Delane Weeks uh, developed from the very beginning of the company while we were a private co. And we continue to, to lead the charge in trying to find ways for corporate entities to do work differently. So, yes, we brought dentists. We know that about Anchor. Right? That's always the first thing that comes up. The second thing we know about Anchor is you're searching for gold and you have three prospects. You did a small bit of drilling at one of them and you have a larger program about to get underway. That's correct. So let me spend a couple of minutes here. I'm just going to back this presentation up so that your viewers get a chance to see some of the data and the details of, in, in, a, in sort of a logical uh, method here. So we continue to have five licenses in Cambodia, northeastern Cambodia, and we have approximately 1,000 square kilometers. It's 983 square kilometers to be exact across those five licenses. We own them 100%. And in some cases, what we've done in the past is we've brought new partners to bear positively, use their dollars to, to further the exploration activities on some of it. And you know, we've worked with Jogmec out of Japan on a copper porphyry on the Oya Dao South license here, if you can see my cursor. But today what I'm gonna to talk to you actually about are two licenses. One is called Andong Mia, and that's that blue license to the north. There's two targets in particular that we're working on. One's called Wild Boar, and the other is Canada Wall. And then this license to the south, and it's called the Cognac license. And the prospect in particular that we're working on is the peacock prospect. Now, it's really interesting, Peter, because Cambodia is not known for its production on precious metals nor on base metals, nor is it known for oil and gas uh, production. And that's because it's only recently that these milestones are being achieved. 
So in December, late December, Cambodia became an oil producing company, a country, I apologize, where Chris Energy out of Singapore brought their offshore oil platform online. In Q2 of this year, our former partner on this license, uh, it's an Australian company called Emerald Resources. They'll be pouring their first Doré bars in Q2 of this year, which will be the completion of that full circle of identification of an early stage exploration license asset, move through the exploration process, mining, permitting, building out the mine and pouring gold. Now Cambodia has modern mining in place as well. So it's, a, it's exciting for everybody because I think that really has a positive impact, not just on Emerald's shareholders, but I think ours as well. It shows that you can invest in this country. So quickly, we'll talk about this license in particular. So this is the program that you mentioned that's just been completed. It's a drill program. It was a drill program. That's right. And Emerald had drilled 15 holes onto this target last year, a year and a half ago, I'm sorry. And the best intercept was about 3.61 grams per ton over eight meters. It was it was a, it was interesting target, but it was an RC drill hole. So what we did is we twinned that hole, got direction and some structure data, and that allowed us to step out. So we extended our understanding around that initial, that initial, those initial results. 600 meters is a short, a short program, um, and I hope to see some results back from the from the lab sometime in the next couple of weeks. Labs around the world are busy right now. You know it's so true, and we're, we're very fortunate. And I say this sheepishly because I don't want everyone starting to send their 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 lab uh, their assay needs down to uh, Australia and, and Southeast Asia, but. We usually can get a turnaround of around four weeks, four to five weeks, and that's that's pretty exciting, pretty good right now. The other license that we're working on is the Andamia license. That was that blue license to the north on the on the map that I showed you earlier. And what we're going to be doing is we've moved our team from the cognac license to the south up to the to the to the northern license, and we're going to be focusing on two targets. The first one is the wild boar target. Now, in early 2020, we actually had cores on the property out of Korea, and they did a, a, a ground truthing program, and they came back with some assay results that got, got us clearly excited. And they were sort of top end 55 grams per ton on some surface results. We sent our team back in there in uh, October, November, once the rains have subsided. And we came back with some great results on top of that, high grading up north of 70 grams per ton. Now, these are these are... These are float samples. We've never drilled the target, but we've identified four key areas that we're going to be working on. And right now we've got a team on the ground doing further surface mapping and trenching along those four targets. From north to south is about 700 meters. My hope is that within the next two to three weeks, we'll be finishing our trenching program, our pitting program. We'll have targets in, 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 uh, in line and we'll start a 1,000 to 1,500 meter drill program on the primary targets on the uh, wild boar prospect. Cool. So you're known for your co corporate social responsibility. We know that. We know you're looking for gold. But what I didn't know is that Cambodia is now an oil and gas country, That's and right. you have licenses there. So that part I'm fascinated by. Tell me about it. No problem. So in 2019, uh, there was a little bit of information that was produced by the Danish Geological Survey, and it was the missing piece, really, to our puzzle. We've been looking for oil and gas potential in Cambodia for seven years. So it's not like we just decided one day to get in a bed and say, let's, let's look for oil and gas. It's something we've, we've taken very seriously. The ma entire management team has oil and gas experience, and we've, been, and we've been focusing significant efforts to try and decide, is the time right to move forward? And in late 2019, we submitted our application for Block 8. And Block 8 became very interesting to us because uh, essentially you have, I'm just going to flip through a, a, different, a different map here. You have oil production, Peter, all around Cambodia. That's the red circles? These red circles represent major oil fields and gas fields. So here in the Gulf of Thailand, you've got offshore oil production. You have the Kulong Basin offshore of Vietnam, and you've got the Korat Plateau to the north along the border with Cambodia and Thailand. There's 23 TCF of gas in place here. Every major gas producer has a concession within this, within this area, and it often finds uh, comparables. The USGS uh, uh, group put together a, a, a report about three or four years ago comparing this to the Permian. 
I mean, it's 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 a it's a prolific area for gas production. You've got, but, but why why not in Cambodia? Well, this is the million dollar question, and I think realistically, let's just back this up to this map again. There were some onshore concessions that were under uh, ownership or 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 the uh, the uh, with with Jobmec and and Petro Vietnam, excuse me. And they had they had some licenses to the north that this is called Tony Sap Lake. They had three licenses here, and uh, they didn't do anything with them. They sat on them. Now nobody has drilled a deep hole into Cambodians' onshore potential to date. Now our cons- our our theory is that this might be a little bit overcooked. You know, I'm not a technical guy, Peter. So forgive me if I'm offending any of your viewers, but I'd like to keep it simple. Overcooked. Overcooked means there's potential for gas. So the liquid hydrocarbons is really our primary focus. And I think that there's great potential to the south for gas as well. And let's not forget, Cambodia needs everything. So right now, from an from a energy production perspective, Cambodia is keen to see oil and gas production coming online because they want to they want to move away from coal production produced energy. So at the end of the day, they're very supportive of our work of the work of Chris Energy offshore here in this area in the Gulf of Thailand. But just to quickly give you a sense, as I mentioned, just north of here, 23 TCF, that's, that is a massive amount of gas in place. When we found out from through the Danish Geological Survey that the temperature levels were in the oil window, that was when the light went off and we decided that Block 8 was, was, was the area for us. And it's also a very familiar structure it's called a foreland basin. And basically what that means is it's very similar to Alberta's oil sector. So if you look at Alberta's structures, you've got a mountain range, you've got a sedimentary basin that abuts up against that range, and you've got a source rock underneath that. That's your basic foreland structure. You've got in Alberta, you've got the Zagros Mountains. We're smaller, of course. We're not, we're not proposing that the, that the potential is as great as in size and scope. But there's certainly all the mis- all the pieces that you'd want in a, to, the, to, to ensure that the, you had the pieces to the puzzle. Everything appears to be in place in Cambodia. And we're pretty excited by that. You've got, you, you've got to have a section showing us that. Well, you know, there you go, Peter. You, 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 read, you, you, you read my mind. So this is, your, this is an, a cross-section of an offshore line of seismic that was shot just below that concession area. And this matches up perfectly with what we saw from seismic to the north in that gas basin. So if you see it to the south and you see it to the north, and this appears to be all one big basin that runs and that's been that's been cut up a little bit through through some faulting over over the over the uh, millennia, you've got really this this contiguous basin that runs south to north it, all the way through Cambodia, and we're excited to be the first ones to test it. When will that happen? That's that was the question I thought you were going to ask. So in early 2020, we were just in the process of our production sharing contract negotiations. So we have to sit down with the Cambodian government. We all have to come to terms of how this pro, how this uh, asset will be built out over time, all the way through to production. Uh, health health pandemic hits, and uh, this is early March, and uh, air, airways start to close, and we decide as a, as a group that we would put it on on pause for a period of time. Not dreaming it was going to be a year, but it ended, has ended up being a year. And my hope is that we'll finish negotiations, re-engage and finish negotiations starting sometime in March and uh, take as long as we need to. But we've obviously seen a very strong oil and gas market uh, build up uh, since it, since its its lows in, in that during that time frame during the uh, health crisis. So we're very excited to get moving on this. Okay. So what's slide 11? Slide, is, slide 11 was back to where we started, which is at the end of the day, 12 years of experience allows for us to have amazing relationships and, and fundamental uh, access to assets that I don't know if everyone would get because of the fact that we've done work the way we have. We've told them what we're going to do. We've done what we said we were going to do. And we've always been transparent and we've worked closely with the local communities all the way up to the ministry and then the, the highest levels of government. It's because of that great relationship that we were given the only access to an onshore oil block at this time. No other company has an onshore oil block 
uh, access to an onshore oil block in Cambodia today. Well, that is what you're known for, and you're known for the gold, and now I will tell people about the oil and gas. I find that fascinating. Anchor Resources trades as ANK on the Venture Exchange. Stephen Borrega is the passionate CEO. I suggest you look them up. I'm Peter Clausey, signing off from Investor Intel. Have a safe day. Thanks so much, Peter, for your time today. Have a good one.